So first, a bit of an introduction. Uh, Center Edge Software it was founded in 2004. It's based out of Roxboro, North Carolina. So we're over from the East Coast, Raleigh, Durham area. For those of you who might be familiar, um, and my body's like wanting to shut down so hard <laughs> right now. <laughs> the day is almost done. My brain keeps telling me. Um, but we provide software solutions uh, for entertainment industry, uh, family entertainment centers. These are like multi-use facilities. We might have bowling, uh, go-kart centers, mini golf, uh, arcades, restaurants, things like that. And we support a point of sale that supports all those applications. Um, it's a difficult market to be in because like a lot of point of sale systems, very narrow and targeted. And so to have a point of sale system that allows you to run an entire facility all with uh, different verticals really that with different needs and to incorporate in that into one platform is a real challenge and one that we tackle. And what we're doing now is we have some monolithic applications that are taking a really focused approach at transitioning those to the cloud. Um, so a bit of an introduction on who we are uh, as individuals. I'm Greg Baker, I'm software manager at Center Edge. Uh, my background prior to the entertainment system, uh, entertainment field, really finance, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, things like that. And was really heavily involved in real time data and high availability software and a radiology, uh, private radiology practice. And I'll let Brant introduce himself. Hey, so uh, I'm Brant Burnett. I'm the systems architect at Center Edge. I've been there since 2004. So I have seen the move from on-premise applications that did nothing on the web to some integrations with web to more and more operations on the web to now moving into microservices architectures with continuous delivery. Uh, I'm also a big uh, Couchbase guy. I do a lot of stuff with Couchbase all the time. That's our uh, NoSQL solution that we use. Uh, and then I also do a lot of open source work to uh, when I can find time, uh, including a, a couple of pull requests into Spinnaker, but not many. Uh, because I'm not a, a Java groovy guy. Um, and the, then the, I can be reached on Twitter at btburnett3 if anybody wants to reach me. Uh, so the next thing I want to do is just to help frame the rest of the conversation is kind of talk about what our basic architecture for our modern microservices architecture looks like. Um, so first of all, everything is coming in to, through a load balancer that is defined by an ingress in Kubernetes. Uh, and then that's actually an AWS uh, application load balancer that is being created by that ingress, which then is routing the traffic either to our UI service, which is distributing an Angular uh, UI, which is then getting its static resources uh, out of an S3 bucket uh, through a CDN, or it's going to our API gateway that we run internally, which we call MashTub because we like bourbon. Um, and so that is then mashing those API requests up into multiple requests out as needed to different microservices within Kubernetes, correlating them back together and returning responses back. And then our back plane is behind the microservices is primarily Couchbase and RabbitMQ as our message bus. Uh, though we do have the option to pick other uh, services as needed for any given microservice, whatever the best fit is. Uh, but that's primarily what we use there. So let's talk about kind of where you start from when you're doing a CI CD pipeline. Uh, uh, just about everybody's uh, done CI, so th the beginning of this flow will be uh, pretty self-explanatory. So the first thing you start off with is you've got your code, you're doing merges in GitHub. So you, you got pull requests going out, code review happens, it gets merged into the master branch. So then what do you do with it from there? Well, the very first thing you do when you're writing a new application is you just build it locally on your machine, you deploy it into Kubernetes using YAML files. And hey, my application's running. That works great the first time or two or three, but it starts getting old. Uh, so your next step then is to add continuous integration to the process. So now we have Jenkins or some other CI platform that's actually building your application for you and creating your artifacts. Um, this is where a lot of people have been for a lot of years. Uh, then, so our next step after that was we added Spinnaker to the mix. So we had a, a Spinnaker pipeline, which is triggered by uh, the publishing of the Docker image to the Docker registry, then triggers the Spinnaker pipeline. And so now we actually have 
a full pipeline going out into Kubernetes uh, without manual intervention. Kind of our next step after that is to handle configuration within our different environments using config maps and secrets within Kubernetes to help inject environment specific configuration into there. Um, so I'm going to go through these different steps in a little more detail and then we'll pass it over to Greg to go over some of the really cool stuff we do with it. Uh, so the first thing is our branching strategy. Uh, we very specifically regularly merge everything into the master branch, meaning no long lived feature branches. Our goal is to merge any work you do within a day. Uh, and so we're going to use a lot of tricks to help support that, such as feature flags. Uh, I know I actually saw some guys here from Launch Darkly today. We started using them recently to manage our feature flags for us. Um, and then uh, also, and that allows us to have partially complete work that's stable and functional that's not going to affect everybody constantly going into master so that we don't have, like we used to, a feature branch that lived out there for three months. And God help you when it comes time to merge that back in that you'll have merge conflicts everywhere. So we try to constantly merge into master. Uh, and the next thing is how we handle version numbers. This is an example of how people used to handle version numbers back in the day with all these different segments and dots. For our microservices, we don't do that. Our version number of a microservice is the Jenkins build number from the master branch. So every single time we merge into master, that's a new version, that's the version number of it. Uh, which just greatly simplifies tracking and dealing with the the versioning of it so the next piece is kind of continuous integration what are we doing in jenkins uh, and i don't know what the formal definition is but the way i think of it in my head for continuous integration versus continuous delivery continuous integration is the part this building and creating artifacts continuous delivery is getting those artifacts to production um, so that's kind of where I'm drawing the line for this presentation anyway. Uh, so we're outputting our container artifacts, artifacts to a private Docker registry. Um, we are outputting the static content, meaning our CSS, JavaScript files, images, anything like that that's coming off of our UI layer into S3. And then we actually make a separate folder inside our S3 bucket for every single build. So then any given version of the server can reference the exact same static content off of our, our CDN that goes with that particular uh, build on the server side. And so we end up with lots and lots of copies of our static content, but it, it really streamlines the process for us. Uh, and the next thing is, this is something that should be obvious, but it's amazing how often you run into people who don't do this. All of our credentials are stored in Jenkins, not in our code base. Uh, you don't want your credentials sitting there in, in Git. Uh, where they can leak out and things like that. So we store the credentials in Jenkins and just reference them uh, from within our build pipelines as through environment variables or other tricks like that to get the credentials in. Uh, and then we have what I consider the really special sauce that really starts kicking this up to the next level in either the CI part. First of all, we're doing all of the work that requires any kind of tool inside Docker containers. So our build agents for Jenkins have Git, Docker, and Docker Compose on them. That's all that's installed on our build agents. Every single tool that it needs to do anything is actually running inside of a container. And what this allows us to do is not have to worry about versions. You don't have to worry about what version of Node is installed on this agent versus that agent, or using tools that switch versions of Node that you're running in, or versions of the .NET uh, core command line SDK, or what you don't worry about it. You just have build agents. They're doing their work, do everything inside Docker, and pull the right image out of Docker Hub that they need to do their work. Uh, the second thing is we use the Jenkins file pipelines that are declarative pipelines that you write inside your Git repository. Uh, we certainly have used other CI tools in the past where you have to define all the steps of your build in the CI tool. But then that quickly gets into a mess as soon as you're making a change to your system that requires a change to the pipeline and the build steps. Because then, okay, now I've got a pull request that makes a change, but then I need to make a change to my build steps. But if I make the change to the build steps first, I'm breaking all the other builds. If I make it second, then it won't, my build will fail and I'll merge. This way, your pull request that requires build changes has those step changes as part of that pull request. And so it just keeps everything organized and version controls your actual build steps as well. Um, 
So next, our Spinnaker pipelines. Um, so first, we're triggering right now based on when the new image is pushed to the Docker registry. We want to change to triggering based on the completion of the Jenkins build instead and use a Jenkins-based trigger instead of a Docker-based trigger because we want to inject some additional data in there uh, through property files coming out of Jenkins. Uh, one of the things we really want to do, for example, is use webhooks back to JIRA, which manages our issues, so we can flag issues in JIRA as deployed. So I need to know the JIRA issue number coming in that uh, property coming off of uh, Jenkins. Right now, there's some limitations. You can't really inject Spinnaker artifacts from a Jenkins trigger, but there's some work in progress that I'm thinking, but I'm hoping by 1.11 we'll uh, have resolved that, and so then we'll start switching. The other thing is we're actually using Google Container Registry for our Docker images, even though everything else we do is on AWS. Uh, and that is actually because Google Container Registry supports the catalog endpoint, which means that I don't have to predefine the list of Docker registries that f for however many microservices we have in Spinnaker and constantly redeploy Spinnaker every time we have a new microservice that's in a different registry. Um, because it can actually just pull from the catalog in Google Container Registry the list of all the registries you have rather than just the list of tags on a predefined list of registries. So it just simplifies our ability to roll out more new microservices without touching uh, Spinnaker and Halyard. Um, we use the V1 Kubernetes provider. Uh, we started using Spinnaker last year. The V2 provider wasn't an option yet. We're probably going to look at switching at some point, but for right now, the V1 provider has given us what we need. So we're just uh, rolling with it for the moment. Uh, and we're also doing red-black deployments. These are also known as blue-green deployments. If you've ever watched any Red Hat presentations, they're always talking about blue-green deployments instead of red-black. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why everybody <laughs> picks different colors. I have some theories, though. Uh, one is that it's like roulette, and you have red and black squares. You've got a 50-50 shot. Your deployment's going to work, <laughs> I, which I don't think is where we want to be. The other one is that red and black is the colors of blood and death. Uh, which you also don't want to happen with your deployment. So we typically actually refer to them as blue-green deployments rather than red-black, even though the Spinnaker UI calls them red and black. And our pipeline succeeds once our Kubernetes pods liveness and readiness probes pass. This is actually an area we're still tweaking, is what do we consider uh, live versus what do we require to be healthy. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly the balance here. Uh, in some cases, we've said we don't consider it uh, we consider it healthy if it's not connected to the database, but not ready. And that is helpful if the database backend goes down so your pods don't sit there and constantly recycle themselves. They just go back to healthy once they're reconnected. But we've also run into problems where the database SDK was just in a bad state and needed to be recycled. And so in those cases, it's better for it to be in the readiness probe. So we're still trying to tweak and balance uh, what exactly falls into which categories. So for our configuration, we, we actually try to put most of our configuration in the repository, including environment-specific configuration. Uh, most of your programming languages have the ability to in, have environment-based configuration. Uh, uh, .NET Core does. Uh, if you're using Node Config, it does. Uh, I think Spring Boot does if you're Java. Um, so we actually try to put all that into the, re into the repository, and because we're continuously deploying master, that means that if I need to make a configuration change for one environment, it's just a pull request into master, and now I've got history on all that configuration. So all of that's just constantly going in and constantly going out. Uh, so within a few minutes, I can get a configuration change all the way out to production just with a pull request and have that full, robust history in my repository. But not all configuration belongs there. So we found certain forms of configuration that we find is better to put into Kubernetes as config maps and secrets. Connection info for shared infrastructure. So we, you, you saw in the architectural diagram earlier, we had Kubernetes, I mean Couchbase and RabbitMQ running as backplane behind all the microservices. If I needed to spin up and transition over to a new cluster due to a version upgrade or something like that, I wouldn't want to have to go put a pull request into every repository to change which cluster it's connecting to. Uh, so for that stuff, we put that into config maps or secrets, so then we have one place to change and we can repoint every application to new infrastructure. 
The second, of course, is security credentials, shared keys, stuff like that. You never want that in your code. So we put that in secrets. Um, we're currently applying our configuration by injecting environment variables in our pipelines. So in our deployment steps, we'll say, go grab this configuration from this Kubernetes secret, put it in this environment variable, so forth and so on. However, that will quickly make you start wanting to pull your hair out when you start getting a lot of configuration and you so many environment variables that you're trying to set in your pipelines. Uh, so our next plan is to switch to using Kubernetes volume mounts, uh, which will allow us to mount a folder full of configuration files and then change our application to read those configuration files. That also has the advantage that if you design your application to support it, it can monitor the file system for changes to configuration and change it dynamically without having to recycle your pod, which you would have to do with environment variable changes. Uh, but that is something we have not actually implemented yet. So now we've got this pipeline that's taking code in master getting it all the way out to production as soon as we merge into master. So now the next big question is, how do we do that and keep the things stable and make sure things don't go down? So for that, I'm gonna pass it back to Greg, who's gonna to talk to you about how we do our automated testing on this pipeline. So, so based on the questions I'm hearing, I can already tell, right? This, this seems like madness. So we're, riding the, we're definitely riding the lightning a little bit. If that anything that comes into master, runs out to production, how are we managing that, right? How are we making that safe, or at least as safe as we can? So there's gonna end up being a lot of automated testing. We've got the usual stuff. I mean, this is, these are things you, wouldn't, you, know, you, you would expect to see. Uh, unit tests, in our case, we also added isolated integration tests. So it allows each one of our applications to spin up and make sure that it's integrated with RabbitMQ, with our database, if it's dependent on any other microservices, something we try to keep to a minimum, like we don't want our applications talking directly to each other, but in some cases uh, we found a need to do that. This allows us to isolate that, those tests and run them. Second uh, fun bit of work that we do is pre-production. Um, so, I'm sorry, I can't stand behind the lectern stuff. Yeah. So we have the Docker trigger, right? And we've got our production pods. So new code commits come in. It's been merged into master, gonna get built. Trigger's gonna pick it up. It's not going to promote directly to production. What we're gonna do is run a pre-production pod. So what does, that, what does that mean? For us, for all intents and purposes, it's production. It's using the same config maps, it's using all the same secrets. It's just not receiving any traffic from our load balancers. It's just running out there um, and we can hit it directly through endpoints you know, that we're aware of but aren't publicly made available anywhere. So we, now we have a container running our code that's essentially production ready or at least pr potentially production ready. And the last thing we're gonna do is run a series of smoke tests against that pre-production pod. So these smoke tests are going to exercise this potential new deployment and, it's, and for the most part, make sure it's gonna be okay. It's not gonna break anything. Everything that our, our customers, of course, are accessing through a public-facing API, we wanna make sure that that public-facing API, nothing coming in and out of there has changed. It's, a, it's all good. We honestly don't care how the pod does its work. As long as what's coming in and out of the public API is good, we're fine. Um, so one of the last things to add to this was templates in Spinnaker. Um, Templates allowed us, what we found initially, we're creating all these applications in Spinnaker and we're constantly essentially copying and pasting these template, uh, the JSON, and tweaking it for the new application. But there wasn't a lot changing. So templates allowed us to move, away, move all of that into common YAML files and start to share that in uh, config files in Spinnaker. And we'll touch on that a little bit more deeply here in a few minutes. So talking more in depth about our unit and ISO integration tests. So you know, our pull request comes in, it goes through code review, gets checked off on. We run all of our unit tests and that, if th that's all successful, we're actually gonna create a Docker container at the end of that process. So at this point, you know, we have a, a reasonable amount of confidence as, as much as, you know, as engineers and developers, we <laughs> are confident in ourselves we like to kind of at least prove it works. We think it works. So the next thing we're gonna do is run some Docker Compose files. 
And this is where that Docker Compose file is what's going to spin up our ISO environment. This is going to be a simulated local environment where this container has access to everything it needs. Uh, RabbitMQ, a fake database, any other uh, third-party ap applications it might need, those two are containerized and then run in that Docker Compose. So we've got this little local network running. And make sure this Docker container has everything it needs. If those tests all pass, now we're feeling much more confident that this, this isn't going to break anything. We're feeling pretty good. We're going to throw that up to Google Container Registry. That's what we use. I mean, you could use whatever. Um, at this point, we could even take uh, Jenkins artifacts if we wanted to and <coughs> grab those directly from Spinnaker. But in our case, we're going to put this container out in the con Google Container Registry. And it might be worth mentioning, like at this point, um, tagging of our containers. We give them numbers, build, they're the, essentially the build numbers. Uh, we don't ever rely on latest for uh, kicking off any of our deployments because latest is not necessarily the most, the, the newest. I mean, it was the most recent one built, but it's not necessarily, um, right, thank you. If, if you didn't hear that. Stabless. Stabless, right. So we're going with very, <laughs> right, we're, so we're going with very specific numbers. Um, gives us more control. Latest is like a little sketchy <laughs> to rely on. All right, so uh, from our unit tests and integration tests, we, we got a container, a potential, a potential production pod. So the pipeline is going to pick up that production pod um, out of the container registry. It's going to kick off a pre-production pipeline. And again, that pre-production pipeline has all the same settings as a production pipeline would. Uh, for all intents and purposes, it is production as far as everything hosting it is concerned. Then we're going to run a new a round of smoke tests. Um, this is something we learned and we feel like we did wrong initially. Initially, our, and, and a lot of our pipelines are still doing this, so we're, we're, we're fixing this. Our smoke tests were hitting this pre-production pod directly. And so what we ended up found out we were missing was, yes, the code application works. The API fails. Our, our, the API that our consumers and our own products are consuming might fail. There could be a change that was done here in this application where uh, some, some of the data or whatever it was sending in or out got changed, wasn't captured by the API, and this test completely missed it. So here we are thinking, wow, this, this container is awesome. It's ready to go. It doesn't break anything. Actually promoted in production. And now the consumers of our third-party API are seeing errors that we didn't catch. So to fix that, smoke tests now run through our, ga our gateway. They run through our API, REST API, and an API gateway. And we're using headers and other tools to be able to control that these smoke test requests are coming from a testing request, and so they can route the traffic to the pre-production pod. Now, now I'm actually, we feel like we're actually testing what matters, and that's what our customers are consuming and interacting with. I mean, do they, they, do they really care what this does on the back here? No, they, they really don't. They care that this API they're interacting with does its work correctly. So we felt that was a, an important shift we've made recently. So those smoke tests are you know, going to make the request, check all the responses, everything's looking good if those smoke tests pass. And we're going to check for a success. This is a Jenkins build running in the Spinnaker pipeline. We're going to check for a success message from this Jenkins build. If we get that, we'll promote this pod into production. <coughs> so to focus a little bit on uh, uh, pipelines, um, if, how many of you have actually written a Spinnaker pipeline? It's fun, isn't it? By hand in the YAML files? Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> so this, was our, this is how we got started. Um, we're creating applications in Spinnaker. Oh, this is great. UI is awesome. It's easy. You click here, click that. Maybe you edit a few things in the JSON configs. It takes a couple hours. It's easy. You know, maybe for a new person, it takes all day. You kind of train them up. Neat. So one of my engineers is like, well, that's awesome. But what about when we have like a few hundred or a thousand of these things out there? And I got to make a change in all of them at once. 
And my reaction was pretty much that. Like, it's, tear, it's tearful Michael Jordan face. Um, <laughs> so that's going to introduce us to Spinnaker Pipeline templates. Like, this will save you from that madness. Don't do, so don't, don't, yeah, if you've written a couple templates, do it, learn it, figure out what's going on. That will be helpful, but you're going to want to switch to type templates really, really soon. So you end up in uh, Spinnaker uploading essentially a config file. This YAML config is going to run probably 40, 50 lines of YAML. It's really easy to read. You tweak a few variables there to make it fit your application. Because this template's going to be 400 plus lines, probably, of, of YAML. And trying to edit that thing and maintain it is a nightmare, especially once you're get crossing that 10, 12, 20, 50 applications referencing it. It's going to become unmaintainable. So this was a huge, huge win and a huge change for us. Um, these config files are also kind of, uh, we're moving these now to they're also in the repos with the code. So the repo also has its config baked into the, with it. Uh, template files, unfortunately, it's a little bit of a, I mean, it's not all roses, right? Um, one of the things on the template files, we're, we're still hosting these in a publicly available, it's a public repo you can hit in GitHub. Um, there's some limitations on Spinnaker. I, mean, I guess there's some workarounds. But we haven't really dug into it yet. But the easiest path to getting this ready is host these in S3 or some other bucket that's publicly available, your templates. Sp Spinnaker then can reference those. And you just put the URL in your config file of where to find the template. Um, the config files also define all your uh, environment, not environment variables, but the values that you want to inject into this template. There's going to be tons of variables you're going to end up putting in this template to reuse it. And um, we've got coded samples we're going to share with you later. You can just go grab from a GitHub repository and take a look at how we did this. So what do we find, like pipeline benefits? Like, awesome. What's, well, why, are they, why use them? Well, they increase speed for one thing. Eliminate, eliminate duplication. Um, one of the, again, one of the things is, you know, if, we, if we're writing the same template file over and over and over for each application and just making a few tweaks, um, it's one, wasteful. Uh, it's a waste of time. It's hard to maintain. And so we had to get rid of that. Also created errors. So moving to configs and templates reduces the amount of errors we have. Maintenance costs are down. And if I have to roll out a change that needs to go to every application, I, change, I put it in the template. And uh, now it's out there. Downside is, because we're not using volume mounts yet, again, it's not all roses, Spinnaker isn't aware of changes to this template file. So if you actually make a change in your templates, you're still going to have to go recycle all your pods to get those changes out into production. Volume mounts will help fix that. Um, we're able to consolidate all of our updates. Again, this is just part of putting shared code together, making it easier to work with. It's a much lower learning curve um, as a manager um, onboarding new talent and bringing people in. If I have to hand them hundreds and hundreds of lines of new YAML code to work with. I mean, it's just kind of mind boggling and they've never worked with it before. But if I can say, hey, here's a project, you just need to worry about the config file and make sure it works for your application, change a few variables, it's much easier to get them onboarded. We can work them into the, heart, into the other stuff later. And finally, I think this is also a huge win version control. I know who made the change, I know when it made it. I can track it back to breaking changes that got into production. So that's, that's another huge win. So we're getting towards like kind of what we learned, right? Um, what was the good stuff? Things we learned was focusing our testing effort. I mean, initially, we again, we were all over the place. We had tests that were testing the microservice and similar tests were testing the API and similar tests were like, God. Always be reviewing your testing and your CI CD process and look for where are we doing the same thing twice and can we stop doing that? Pipeline templates. I just cannot say this enough. If you're not using them yet or if you're interested in getting into Spinnaker, you're going to want to use this. This will save you a huge amount of time. Code first swagger definitions. Anybody familiar with swagger? Use swagger, right? Again, those are really fun to write by hand. 
the other, so they had a problem. We were writing these swagger definitions for our APIs by hand. Well, you can imagine when you have a whole team of developers, each one of them writing swagger definitions, as much as you try to control that, each one ends up being a little different. There's somebody, somebody defines their things just a little differently here than theirs. Things aren't consistent. So we got away from that. We finally were just like, screw it. It's not working for us. So we put in a swashbuckler. Uh, this is a .NET core thing. It works, uh, integrates with .NET. This actually allows our engineers to do what engineers do, write code. And we can just it, generate a Swagger definition file uh, from the code directly. Finally, um, code samples, like this is stuff, uh, we have uh, Center Edge slash Spinnaker Summit 2018. If you want to go take a look at some of our code samples, pull it down. And I, I put links to Orca and Rower. Look at how it works. Like, if <laughs> it's, it's out there if you've got questions. Um, and then finally, uh, obviously, thank you. I mean, just big thanks to Spinnaker team, Modev, every engineer and developer who's ever put in a pull request. It's helped us. We hope we've helped you guys too.